Thank you very much, Dean Jackson. Thank you, colleagues, students, partners. It is really a privilege to be here today and celebrate with all of you this 50th anniversary of Boston's public university, the University of Massachusetts, Boston. I have the challenge and the honor to be the first of these TED Tent Talks. So, I will therefore try to challenge you and inspire you. I want to challenge you to rethink, rethink some stereotypes that we have been taught, that we have been exposed to about what we call the global environment. I want to inspire you. I want to inspire you to come up with a new narrative, with a new vision, and to join us. To join us as students, as some of you already have, as scholars in colleges that are partners to ours or others, and as collaborators across the city, across the Commonwealth, and across the globe. Today, my task is to speak about students and scholars as diplomats, because that's our mission at Boston's public university, is to train students to be scholars, but also to be diplomats, to be ambassadors about what we have termed the global environment. The global environment today is not just the environment of the globe as a whole. It's the environment that is local, that is regional, that is transnational, but there is only one environment. Whether it's local or global, it is one environment, and that is the one of the planet. We have one planet. There is no planet B, and we have no plan B. As our commencement speaker of this past year, Christiana Figueres, the Secretary General of the Climate Change Convention said, we have no plan B because we have no planet B. So we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility as students, as scholars, as professionals to treat this planet with responsibility and with respect. But so, what are the stereotypes about the environment that we have been exposed to and that I'd like to attempt to challenge today? There are three. And you've heard this quite a bit. Stereotype one, we need to save the planet. And you've heard this multiple times and you probably believe as an environmental policy scholar, I will come here and tell you how as students and scholars we should save the planet. No, we cannot save the planet because the planet needs no saving. The planet needs no saving. The planet will be just fine without us. This planet has gone through many eras and many eons without us. It is us that need the planet. It is us that need the saving. We cannot survive without the planet. We cannot survive without environment without air, water, food, energy, shelter. This is what the environment provides for us. If we disappear, the planet will be just fine. If the planet cannot provide any of those ingredients, we will not be fine. We will not survive. So I'd like to challenge that number one myth Let's save the planet. We cannot save the planet. The number two stereotype. We can manage the environment. Indeed, there is a whole discipline of environmental management. We probably teach it. Actually, I have a degree in it. I hold officially a master's degree in environmental management. That's what it says in my diploma. From this country's oldest environment school. 
the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, gives a degree in environmental management. And yet, I stand here today to tell you that my degree is wrong. We cannot manage the environment because we're part of it. We can only manage our behavior. As a part of the environment, we are in a symbiotic re relationship with it. Often, actually, we are in a parasitic relationship with it. Sometimes we behave like a virus, even. But yet, we cannot manage the environment. Our host will survive without us. We cannot survive without our host. Our survival depends on our ability to manage our own behavior. It is only through the management of our own behavior and the systems we create, the economic system, the political system, the environmental, the uh, social system, the cultural system, it is that management that then will allow us to survive on this planet. And stereotype three, it is kind of a dual stereotype. It's almost opposite. Some people say individual action is the answer. You've heard the 10 things to save the planet or the 101 things to save the planet. Ride a bike, turn off the lights, recycle, compost, right? Individual action is what we're supposed to do and it is the answer. The other end of that myth is that individual action does not matter. It's corporate power. Whatever we do as individuals will never make a difference. And I stand here in all this glory on this glorious day and tell you bluntly and brazenly both of those are wrong. Individual action is necessary but not sufficient. Individual consumer action is by far not sufficient. Changing your light bulbs, it may be necessary, but it is far, far, far from sufficient. And individuals matter. But individuals matter not one by one by one, but just as Vicki Kennedy said inside, it's through collective, persistent action again and again and again that individuals matter. Individuals matter through institutions, through the leadership of institutions, through the changing culture of institutions, through political action, economic action, not just at the individual level, but collective economic action. For example, in the recent Climate Change Summit just a couple of weeks ago, 350 investors representing $24 trillion committed to divesting from fossil fuels, including the Rockefellers, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. And how did the Rockefellers make their money? Is through oil. But they were now committed to divesting from the fossil fuel industry. My main message, therefore, is that we cannot manage the environment or save the Earth. We can only manage our behavior and save ourselves. But how do we do that? For that, we need knowledge, we need skills, but most importantly, we need imagination. Because as Einstein once said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Traditionally in higher education, the classroom has been the place where we identify problems and their causes, their root causes, where we answer the question, what to change. More often now, we identify a vision, we search for solutions and try to answer the question, what to change to? What is that vision? But what we're still missing in our classrooms is the ability to answer the toughest questions, how to cause the change. And it is here that UMass Boston has trailed has blazed a new trail as, the Boston, as Boston's public university 
we have students who are actively seeking solutions and actively trying to implement them. And I'd like to just share with you very briefly the stories of our students who are doing that actively, engagedly. Natalia, Michael, two of my students here today in the global governance PhD program in the PhD program in global governance and human security in the McCormick Graduate School. Natalia came to us from Colombia, a graduate of the London School of Economics, a recipient of a scholarship from the Colombian government for five years to do a PhD anywhere in the world. Natalia came to us when she could have chosen any university in the world because she's funded by her own government to receive a PhD degree. <laughs> and Natalia has blazed a trail that no one else has. Not only a student, not even a scholar. We are creating a new environmental conventions index, an index that will measure the level of implementation of international environmental law of 10 conventions for all countries that have signed them for all the years that they have reported. An amazing endeavor, and that will be Natalia's dissertation. Michael, hailing from Massachusetts, coming to us through with a degree from McGill. He joined us to do a master's degree in international relations, and he stayed. He stayed for a PhD in global governance and human security. Because I think he also benefited from a relationship, from a deep relationship we have with Addis Ababa University, in the Horn of Africa Regional Environment Center, where Michael spent two summers as an intern trying to figure out the relationship between agriculture, investment, and environmental policy. And he's now doing a dissertation on this topic. Michael was instrumental in the drafting, the envisioning and drafting of the grant proposal for, to the National Science Foundation that resulted in the $3.1 million grant for this program on coasts and communities, which is between UMass Boston and Addis Ababa University, which is our signature partner. And it seeks to compare and contrast what we, how we relate with, problem, with environmental problems in Boston Harbor and Ethiopia. If you remember your geography, <laughs> Ethiopia is landlocked. So we get a call from the National Science Foundation officer and says, you've written a really good grant, but you know what? Robin Hannigan in the School for the Environment and, and I were the co-PIs in this, a scientist and a social scientist. And, our national, and the National Science Foundation officer says, but what are the commonalities between Boston Harbor and landlocked Ethiopia? And we said, well, don't you know? <laughs> if we train our students to be able to solve the environmental problems of Boston Harbor and landlocked Ethiopia at the same time. They can do that anywhere, anytime. Well, you know the outcome, the end of the story. They were convinced. We got the grant. So in conclusion, I would like to leave you with this. We live on a new earth because we see we feel and we live the interconnectedness that this new earth presents. This requires us to think globally and to act globally. Think globally, act locally no longer, is no longer sufficient. We have to think globally and we have to act globally. And it is our responsibility as scholars, as teachers, to enable our students to do that. And at UMass Boston, the Boston's public, only public university, we seek to serve a global public. A global public that connects the communities next door to the communities in the Horn of Africa. Through our students, 
through our scholarship, through our reach as students, scholars, and diplomats. We seek to create a new philosophy, a philosophy of responsibility, of discipline, and excellence. And with that, we are convinced that we will make a difference in the world because it will be through our students. As Abraham Lincoln once said, the philosophy of the classroom of one generation is the philosophy of the government of the next generation. Thank you.